Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and great to see you here. Some of you I may have seen before. This is my third trip to Sofia and the fourth time that I've spoken at Ratio. And thank you to Petco and Ludo, Lubo and everybody else who's involved in organizing uh, Ratio. It's a fantastic event. Um, I'm afraid they've put me on first. And my talk, unlike the other two, is rather frightening. Okay, so we're going to start off with the serious stuff that you should be worried about. And then the other two talks are going to be much more exciting and fun. So prepare yourself. There will be dreams, but there will also be nightmares. So I want to start by asking you four questions. What if, what would you think, if scientists wanted to get DNA that could cause cancer and put it into a bacterium that lives in your gut. What would you think if scientists wanted to mix up DNA between any two species without having any idea of what would happen? What would you say if scientists were trying to make highly pathogenic viruses even more dangerous? And finally, what would you say if scientists wanted to edit human embryos and then implant them so that those genes that they had changed were passed down the generations? Now, as you may know, all these things have happened. They are not fantasies, they are not dreams, they are reality. And what's really interesting is that on each of these four occasions, the scientists involved, the geneticists, did something unique. They said, we should stop doing these experiments. This is too dangerous at the moment. We need to think about whether it's safe. This happened four times, in 1971, in 1974, in 2012, and then most recently in 2019. And genetics is different from any other science. This is the only time in history that scientists have been so frightened of what they're doing that they have stopped. You've probably heard about the discussions over AI that's happening at the moment. And there have been calls for uh, some kind of pause, but as soon as the calls were made, everybody said, no, we're not doing that, we're going ahead. Even during the building of the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, during the Second World War, once Nazi Germany had been defeated, then the point of the atom bomb evaporated. There was no reason. The Japanese weren't going to have an atom bomb. The whole reason for trying to build the atom bomb was to beat Nazi Germany to this terrifying weapon. So after the defeat of the Germans, the scientists on the Manhattan Project, many of them, said we should stop work. But they didn't. They had lots of arguments, but they carried on and they built the bomb with all the terrible consequences that we know. So genetics is unique. Four times it's done this. What I'm going to do is to explain when this happened, why it happened, what the consequences are, and you can think about whether the fears that people had were justified or not, and then I'm going to show you where we're going at the moment and three reasons why you should be quite alarmed. So to start with, 1971. This is before genetic engineering is a reality. So when it's just an idea in the head of Paul Berg, the man you can see here, the man with the tie. Paul Berg was a very clever uh, geneticist, bio biochemist, who is at Stanford on the west coast of America. And he, he died earlier this year, a uh, brilliant, brilliant man. And he had the plan to uh, try and understand how genes work in mammalian cells. Okay, so in the 1960s, we understood how genes worked in bacteria, but we knew very little about, or nothing in fact, about what they did in mammalian cells. So he got the idea of, okay, with these new techniques that are being developed, this toolkit we have, 
uh, I could maybe get a gene I really understand from a bacterium, from E. coli, and I could put it into a mammalian cell that is living in a dish. And then I could understand what it does. That seems really quite interesting. Uh, to get it in there, he was going to have to use a virus that infects mammalian cells. So it was going to be quite a complicated experiment. But that was what he was trying to do. And he had a PhD student who just started, a young woman called Janet Mertz. And he said to her, OK, Janet, why don't you do the opposite experiment? As I'm not really interested in this, but we could see what happens. What would happen if we tried to put the, vir the, the DNA from the virus we're going to use as a vector to move the DNA into a human cell? Why don't we just see if we can put that into a, an E. coli? In other words, he wants to get a virus which was thought to produce cancer and put it into E. coli. And this is when the first row happens, because Bob Pollack, the younger man with a beard, uh, Bob's still alive, He's very, he looks very much like he does there, he's a bit greyer. He was teaching on a course in Long Island, out on the east coast of America. And he's much younger, you can see these are both pictures from the time. He's much younger, he's a different generation. Bob is not quite a hippie, but he's not as square as Paul Berg was. And there was also a difference in, in their age and in their prestige. Berg was always already a really important person. Uh, and Bob was, you know, pr with all due respect, pretty much a nobody. But he was teaching a course about using cell lines. And Janet Mertz was on that course. And everybody had to explain what project they were doing. And Mertz says, well, I'm going to get this DNA from this virus, so I'm going to put it into E. coli. And Bob goes, what? <laughs> what are you doing? That's crazy. Just imagine. E. coli lives in all our guts. We could actually create an epidemic of cancer-causing uh, cancer bacteria that would spread through the population. So he picks up the phone, the phone you can see just behind him in this photo, and he phones up Paul Berg, and he says, what's this? Literally, this is how the conversation went. He says, what's this crazy experiment you're doing? Now, Berg didn't know who this guy was. He'd never heard of him, and he was extremely rude. I mean, Bob... Uh, Bob is very, very reserved, and he wouldn't tell me what word that uh, Berg used, but I think he probably told him to fuck off. Um, Berg said, I can't remember when I talked to him. Um, so Berg tells Pollack to fuck off, it's none of your business. The conversation goes on, and Berg gradually calms down and says, OK, I'm going to think about this. So he goes away and talks to his various colleagues and friends, and everybody says, well, it's pretty unlikely that anything bad could happen, but you never know. So Berg eventually decides, well, given I don't really care about this experiment, <laughs> that's not what I really want to do, this is just something I've given as a side project to a PhD student, he phones back Bob Pollack and says, OK, we're not going to do it, we're not going to do the experiment. So the first time that geneticists decided not to do something was even before it was a reality. It was when it was being planned. They decided, OK, this experiment could cause something to go horribly wrong. We won't do it. But Berg did carry on with what he was really interested in. And the next year, he published this paper in 1972, which is the first precise alteration of a genome by enabling uh, putting this DNA from E. coli that he understood into a mammalian cell. And Eight, eight years later, he won the Nobel Prize for this work. As soon as he'd done it, other groups immediately started to try and make the technique simpler, because this was horribly complicated. I couldn't have done anything like this, far too, far beyond my pay grade. A year later, this process becomes even easier. And basically, you can now, as Berg put it, anybody can do anything. So to understand this new technique, you just need a kind of high school education. Carrying it out is a bit more difficult, but it's much, much easier. You can move DNA between any species using uh, this principle. And this leads to a great deal of discussion. Even before this paper was published, people were presenting it in conferences, and especially the younger researchers were going, wait a minute, you, you can do anything. 
You don't know what's going to happen. Is this safe? Could we inadvertently create some terrible pandemic? So this led to a letter, an open letter being published by Paul Berg and other researchers who went, OK, maybe we should think about this. And this is published in Science, which is the leading weekly magazine in the USA, and in Nature, which is the British equivalent. And this called for a moratorium on what was called recombinant DNA. So that's DNA from two completely different uh, groups of organisms. And the word moratorium means a pause. And very significantly, this word is taken from the debates that were happening in the 1950s and the 1960s about atomic weapons testing. So they recognized that this word was significant and the, the dangers possibly represented by this technology were perhaps existential, as we're now talking about with regards to AI. And this led to a global debate about the possible dangers of this technique. And for nine months, no researchers anywhere in the world, as far as we know, did any work on recombinant DNA. The culmination of this, meeting, of this discussion was a, a meeting in California at a place called Asilomar, which is on the coast, a beautiful place, in February 1975. And you can see from the photo on the left that there's lots of people, uh, young people with big beards and embroidered jackets and all sorts of things. Uh, and it took place within the presence of the world's press. So there are about 20 journalists there and the whole, the whole proceedings were recorded, but those recordings were uh, put under seal for 50 years. So uh, in two years' time, they're going to be released, and there will be TV programs and radio programs and podcasts all about this event because it was so significant. Why it was so significant was that these about 200 researchers came up with protocols, ways of doing experiments that meant that the experiments could be done safely. So in other words, they self-regulated. So scientists and geneticists in particular are very proud of this meeting because what it suggests is that scientists can control things. They understand the problems and they can come up with nice regulations and we don't need any of those politicians getting involved. So self-regulation, and of course that puts a lot of responsibility onto the scientists. Now, that's really significant. We had these debates, you can see in this picture, they're arguing at the dinner table, and they're scribbling experiments down on the placemats, trying to work out how we can do this safely. But what they're discussing is how to do it. In the words of Derek Malcolm in Jurassic Park, they're thinking about whether they could do the experiment, not whether they should do it. They're just thinking about how can we do this safely. They're not thinking about whether it's the right thing to do. However, they come up with these protocols and these ways of treating potentially dangerous DNA are still with us today. Now, the significant thing about this is that as I said, this is self-regulation. But what they actually did was in the USA, they said, OK, we will recommend to the main funder, the main governmental funder of research, the National Institutes of Health, that they only give money if people follow these protocols. What that meant was that if you were in the private sector, you didn't have to follow them at all, because it wasn't law. It was just a recommendation. Now, elsewhere in the world, for example, in the UK or in France or Germany, these recommendations actually became law. But we have a slightly different and perhaps easier way of uh, introducing uh, regulation into law in Europe than they do in America, where they're very hostile to any kind of regulation. The final point is what didn't they discuss? They didn't discuss. They ruled off the agenda of Asilomar any discussion of gene therapy, so that's using DNA to cure genetic diseases, any discussion of biological weapons, although they recognize that recombinant DNA 
could make the most terrifying weapons possible. They said, we're not discussing that. And they refused to discuss any potential consequences for the environment. You can see, it's all about can, not should. It's all about enabling the, uh, the moratorium to be lifted and the work to begin again. So this is the big decision in uh, February 1975. It leads to a, a further global debate, lots of argument, uh, lots of fears about potential diseases. Twice in the UK, in 1973 and 1976, we had outbreaks of smallpox, terrifying disease, which came from laboratories. There were laboratory accidents and people died. Uh, because they were infected. So there was a reason, there were plenty of good reasons for people to be worried about experiments going wrong, leaks from labs, and so on. But, despite all this argument, within five years, the whole thing looked like it wasn't really relevant. Everybody kind of forgot about it, for three reasons. Firstly, the biosecurity protocols worked. Nobody died. And it's still the case. This is all work. You can see in this picture here, nowadays, if you're manipulating a dangerous microbe, you have to be in this balloon suit. So that's got high pressure in it, right? That's why they're all, they've got air coming down. So if they were to puncture the suit, the microbes couldn't get in because there's higher pressure. The air's going to come out. The room is at lower pressure than the outside. So if the door opens, the air comes in. The microbes can't get out. And, of course, they don't eat in the laboratory. They are wearing gloves and all the rest of it. So this is these protocols which they came up with are still with us, and they work very well. Second reason is it turned out, against everybody's expectations, that the really big, terrifying thing that people were worried about wasn't dangerous at all. What people were particularly concerned about was the possibility, well, what would happen if we got a human gene and we put it into a bacterium? What would it then do with that genetic information? Could it produce something bizarre, mean that the bacterium started to do strange things, or whatever? It turned out that, in fact, if you, get, you do that experiment, nothing happens. And the reason why nothing happens is, as you can see here, our genes, the genes in multicellular organisms, well, all organisms with a, a nucleus in the cell, aren't just straight bits of DNA, A, T, C, T, 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 going from the beginning to end. They're broken up. And our cells have ways of chopping out the bits of nonsense that are interrupting the actual message, but a bacterial cell doesn't. So if you give one of our genes, which is all in bits and has to be stitched together, to a bacterium, it can't do anything with it. So the experiments people were worried about turn out to be okay. And the final reason is that there was lots of money to be made. Because in the USA in particular, and I'll describe this in a minute, it was realized that, okay, we can't put a human gene, say, for insulin, into a bacterium because it won't work, but we can reverse engineer it. We know what the structure of insulin is, and we can make a piece of DNA which will produce that. And we can then put that into a bacterium, and it will then start churning out insulin. So all of you, or any of you, any of you who use insulin, this is where your insulin comes from. It is made in a microbe. It is not made by uh, an actual animal. It used to be the case that you had to get a dead animal, like a, uh, a cow or a pig, and grind up its pancreas, which is where insulin is produced, and then extract the insulin, which isn't the same. It's not identical to our insulin. So in the end, people with diabetes got quite ill. This recombinant DNA is a work of genius. It's the DNA to produce actual human insulin put into a microbe, and it's changed pharmaceutical production. It's changed our experience of diabetes. So this, from 1980, it looks like things are going to be OK. And we've ended up with these three great dreams of genetic engineering. Firstly, producing drugs. Secondly, improving agriculture. 
and thirdly, curing genetic diseases. And that's been the, the period, the genetic age, that we've been living in for the last 40 or so years. So, firstly, this brilliant piece of work by people who were uh, working in a startup called Genentech. Amazingly, it was created the same week as Apple in the same part of Silicon Valley. So again, it was just two guys uh, who set up a company with the dream that they could change the world, and they did. It was called Genentech. They're the people who produced insulin, and this led to the explosion of the biotech industry. So it literally started off in a rented office in San Francisco, and now Genentech owns the whole area uh, that uh, they, they started working. And to give you some idea of how this has carried on, a paper that just appeared last year describes uh, how they've edited yeast, so it's not a microbe, uh, it's, kind of, it's a yeast, the same yeast that makes wine and beer, to produce a cancer drug. We can make this cancer drug, but it's really, really complicated and it's expensive. It's called vinblastine, and to make the, convince the yeast to do this, it wasn't just a matter of getting a piece of DNA and putting it in like it was with insulin. This involved 56 different edits to the yeast, including introducing genes, 34 genes from plants. So it's amazingly complicated, but it is going to transform lives, it's going to save lives, it's going to enable the far cheaper production of cancer drugs. So this is something that is now a major part of science and technology and is having real important consequences. Probably the most influential form of genetic engineering has been the work on plants. And this took place in the 1980s and involved different groups trying to find ways of changing plants to make them more productive or to enable farmers to use different products. And if you've got good eyesight, you can see that the flashing red box is around the company that was paying for all this in the different labs and including in its own labs. That was Monsanto. Now, Monsanto no longer exists. It's been bought up by Bayer, and it has such a bad press, many of you will have heard of it, everybody hates Monsanto, they're the big bad, uh, that they got rid of the trade name. When Bayer bought it up, they thought, this is more trouble than it's worth, let's just say we're Bayer now. But in fact, Monsanto's work and the sponsoring of this work by all these researchers was really well-meaning. Because in the 1950s and the 1960s, Monsanto was a chemical company. It made DDT, right, which destroyed the ecosystem in America and many other parts of the world. They made AstroTurf, so plastic grass. They made Agent Orange, which was the defoliant used in Vietnam to destroy vast areas of the jungle. So this is everything that's awful, right? I mean, it's just absolutely anti-life. And they recognized this. And the CEO of Monsanto in the 60s, he said, our business plan is unsustainable. We cannot carry on doing this. We have to get out of chemicals. And so they had a really smart idea. They said, OK, at the moment, we're producing these insecticides, say, to kill caterpillars, which will eat crops. But there is a microbe, there's a bacterium, which organic farmers can spray on their fields and will produce itself, just by chance, it produces a protein which is a, an insecticide. It stops caterpillars from growing. And, you know, organic farmers can do this because it's natural, so it's quite safe for humans, there's no problem about it. Why don't we get the gene from this microbe that produces this insecticide and put it into the plant? That way, we're selling plants now, we're selling seeds, we're not selling insecticides. The plant will produce its own natural insecticide. To show you how this works, look at that. So the top ones are corn uh, cobs that have been attacked by the caterpillar. The bottom ones are those that are producing their own insecticide. The caterpillar can't grow in them. So this is absolutely remarkable. This has had an amazing uh, effect on agriculture. But, as you know, opinions vary about whether this is any good. 
And in particular, in the 1990s, you may remember, those of you who are old enough, that there was a huge scare all around the world about GM crops, and in particular about food security. This was partly due to the mad cow disease uh, and the out, uh, that happened in the UK, and beef became very uh, dangerous to eat. And there was a huge worry about this. That had nothing to do with genetic engineering, but the whole of the 90s, were pre people were preoccupied by the dangers of manipulated food, and there was also concern about the new World Trade Organization, which had been set up and which was driving, making countries accept products they didn't want. So we had things like this event in, uh, this is in the UK, this is a, 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 a development of a field of GM plants, and Greenpeace have got dressed up in high, <laughs> in these suits, they don't notice, it's just a stunt, and they're ripping out the, uh, ripping out the plants. And in, again in the UK, we had this, this is uh, the Daily Mirror, one of our tabloid newspapers, uh, and Tony Blair is presented as the prime monster and he said, I eat Frankenstein food and it's safe. So the term Frankenfood or Frankenstein food became very popular. And then in the EU and in many other European countries, the decision was taken that GM crops would not be allowed in the human food chain. But GM crops are allowed to be brought into the EU or even grown in the EU and fed to animals. So if you eat meat, it's quite possible that the meat you're eating has been, uh, the animals that you're eating have been fed GM crops. And you know what? It's quite okay, right? There's no problem about it at all. It will not do you any harm at all. So where are we now? Well, if you go to the USA, Lubo, you like tacos. Uh, if you go to the USA and you eat tacos in general, you will be eating GM crops maize, or GM corn as they call it, because all US maize is now GM to stop the caterpillars eating the, uh, eating, the, eating the corn, eating the product. So in some countries, in particular the USA, this is a major part of agricultural production. And those, that gene I talked about that stopped the, uh, stopped the caterpillars eating has actually had a major consequence. Around about three quarters of a million tons less insecticide has now been sprayed around the planet. So that's got to be a good thing, I think. Whatever you may think about GM crops, this reduction in the use of insecticides is, uh, is, is, well, is, is excellent. But there are a number of really interesting facts. Firstly, productivity has not changed at all. So even in the USA, where they're really into this, and the, the crops were designed for their huge, great big fields with no surrounding ecosystem at all, productivity is the same. Because the crops that you can manipulate in the laboratory and make do this kind of stuff are not necessarily those that are the best suited to the field or that will produce the most food. There are strain differences between different versions of these plants. So it's kind of a a zero-sum game. We're back where we started. All this cleverness hasn't actually improved anything. In fact, in two respects, things have got worse. Because the other thing Monsanto did was to come up with a cunning plan to get back into chemicals and to produce a chemical herbicide that they could make plants resistant to. And that would mean your crop would resist the herbicide, you'd spray the herbicide everywhere, the weeds would die. So you can have your crops closer together. You don't need to weed. And you're spraying the herbicide around with potential consequences for humans. There's still a lot of argument about this, but with very real consequences for the ecosystem. It's terrifying if it gets into water. So that's a very bad thing. And then the second bad thing that's happened is kind of inevitable, and they knew Monsanto knew about this, and they warned everybody. There's a phrase in biology which is, evolution is smarter than you are. So if you find a way of killing or stopping caterpillars growing, it's inevitable that the caterpillars will find, fight back. Inevitable that a mutation will arise, and we have resistant strains of caterpillars. 
So there are now caterpillars that will munch their way through Bt crops, which have got this special uh, substance in them. They don't care. So we're kind of back where we started. My view of GM crops is they're a bit meh. They've amazing ingenuity, but the consequence in the end has really not been any change apart from that reduction in insecticides. What about gene therapy? This was one of the things that very quickly people started promising we're going to have new ways of treating genetic diseases. The first gene therapy protocols came out in 1989, but these were experiments. They weren't actual therapies that were available or should be available. Ten years later, a volunteer in one of these trials, a young man called Jesse Gelsinger, he died of a terrible reaction to the virus, the vector that was delivering this new bit of DNA to his cells. And most recently, this has just happened twice more. Two patients on new therapies, new genetic uh, gene therapies, using the latest gene editing techniques, have both died because of a terrible reaction. So we are far away from having the promises of you know, having gene therapy for every genetic disease. These still remain experiments. You can see in this picture, this is a successful experiment. This shows a baby who's got what's called bubble disease. So these are children whose immune system is completely destroyed. So they have to live literally in a bubble. Any contact with the outside world can risk disease and death. But the baby on the left has been cured. He's had a change to his DNA in his blood cells that has been introduced by genetic engineering. And he is now cured. And he's giving a kiss to the baby who is going to be uh, hopefully soon operated on. But because the, the way that this works, the DNA introduces itself in somewhere into the genome of the baby, Sometimes it went wrong. And in this place in Paris, they cured a dozen children of this disease, but two of them died of leukemia because the gene went into a place in their DNA that led to leukemia. So this is still a very experimental technique. Don't believe the hype about we're all going to be cured of genetic diseases or whatever. But the big change, as you probably know, has come over the last few years. And we've moved away from putting bits of DNA more or less at random into the genome, which is how GM plants have been created, or how the gene therapies have been done. We've got this kind of image. We use a pair of molecular scissors to snip up DNA. And this happened in a series of steps that nobody was expecting. First, people were able to direct enzymes to cut DNA in a very specific place. These are called zinc fingers because they've got bits of zinc. The molecules have bits of zinc that kind of like fingers grasp onto the DNA they're going to target and snip up. So that's what you need. You need to be able to target where you're going to make a change. And these zinc finger enzymes enable this. And then with a, a few years later, a young man called Fyodor Ernoff said, well, this is actually a bit different. We should call this gene editing. And the choice of the term is really significant because it suggests that editing is kind of safe and ordinary. I mean, you all edit. You edit on your computers. You may be editing a tweet on your phone at this very minute. That's kind of safe, isn't it? It's just ordinary. Everybody edits. So the words have changed, but the underlying techniques are essentially the same and, in fact, really, really difficult. A few years later, a fantastic, the future, this was the future, they were called talons. The details don't matter, but the big journals went amazed, went over the top, said, God, this is going to change everything. It's much, much easier than these zinc fingers. We're, this is what we will use forever. Three years later, an even more amazing technique was adopted. Everybody forgot about talons, and you have probably all heard about CRISPR which is the simplest technique we currently have. And this is what we talk about being a set of molecular scissors. It isn't at all, neither is it scissors, neither is it quite so precise as they claim. But it has been a huge game changer. And as you may know, Jennifer Dowden of the USA and Emmanuel Charpentier of France, which she was working elsewhere at the time, won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for their discovery, or probably invention, it should be called, in 2020. Now, CRISPR is changing lives. 
So, this woman, she's called Victoria Gray. One of the major diseases that affects Afro-Caribbean people in Europe and African-Americans is what's called sickle cell disease. And this is a form of altered hemoglobin in your uh, red blood cells. Hemoglobin is what makes your, cell, your blood red and what carries the oxygen. And uh, it means they are anemic, and above all, they are in terrible pain, patients with this disease. And it's really, really uh, debilitating and ultimately uh, lethal. Victoria Gray had an experimental therapy whereby they injected her with some CRISPR, or they removed her red blood cells. They altered these by injecting them with a particular set of CRISPR, and they then turned on a version of hemoglobin, which we all have when we're, uh, when we're fetuses, when we're in the uterus. Yeah? And she is now cured of this. It's quite remarkable. There was a big meeting in London a few months ago, and she was there explaining how she's free of pain for the first time in her life. It's transformed her life. But of course, this has then got to be rolled out to millions of people. It's in, at the moment, it's an experiment. Even if it turns into a therapy, it's got to be cheap and freely available. And that's generally not the way that healthcare works, as we all know, no matter how simple the technique. So I'm now going to, the final part, this is where you get worried, okay, uh, is to address three new potentials that I think everybody needs to know about, okay? Pathogen manipulation, heritable gene editing, and then what I think is the most scary one, environmental manipulation. And all these cases, in general, are well-meaning, right? So there aren't mad scientists trying to kill us all. It's just that it might go wrong, and we need to worry about that before it happens, not after. So, to start, pathogen manipulation. So, I think the first thing to say is nothing that I'm going to say suggests that COVID-19 was engineered in a lab, okay? There is no evidence of that at all. But other experiments are, are being done. At the end of the last century, in 1999, some Australian conservationists we're trying to find a way of getting rid of invasive rice, mice and rats from islands, and indeed from the whole of Australia, if they could. So they started using a, a disease called mousepox, which, as this poor old mouse, you can see, it kills mice. But inadvertently, they discovered that what they had done, as they're doing the experiment, is they had turned ordinary mousepox into a version that would now resist vaccines. Now, you might think, well, that doesn't matter. It's just about mice. We want to kill them, don't we? Well, that's true. But mousepox, maybe as its name suggests, is really closely related to smallpox. So they realized that what they had done is discovered a way of making smallpox, which was a massive killer of human beings until we developed uh, vaccines, of making smallpox resistant to vaccines. So people like me, who had a smallpox vac vaccination, if the vaccine, if the disease were to break out, this a modified disease, it would kill me. For those of you who haven't had vaccinations, well, it would probably kill or severely disable you too. So they were terrified, absolutely terrified. They said, should we publish this? They discussed with the defense agency in Australia, and eventually they decided to publish the data. Two years later, this happened. And the significance of this is basically, if you can remember, it made the USA go kind of crazy uh, for understandable reasons, okay? Uh, it was immediately followed by a series of uh, envelopes containing anthrax, which is a, a disease which makes people, which can kill people. And these were sent, these spores were sent around to various government offices. It had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. It was uh, a crazy white person who decided to jump on the bandwagon and create havoc. But the USA got extremely alarmed, and in particular, they got alarmed by the idea that Islamic terrorists, or any kind of terrorist, might not simply fly an airplane into a building, but might start using genetic engineering to further their ends. Then, one of the next things that people did was to see, well, okay, quite how bad could it be? The answer is very bad. They re recreated the 1918 flu virus. Okay, so the 1918 
that outbreak, which is popularly called Spanish flu, but in fact it came from an American farm. So again, it's a spillover event from contact with animals. 1918 flu pandemic killed nearly as many people as the First World War. So it's far, far worse than COVID-19. And it was recreated. They got the DNA sequence from dead people in, buried in the permafrost, and they got the, the virus out, and they recreated it. Okay. Then, in about 2005, there was something called SARS, which was a, an early warning about COVID. It's very similar. As you can see, it's got that it's a coronavirus. It's like COVID-19. This again occurred in China, and it was a spillover event. They were eventually, after 15 years, it took them 15 years to identify the species of bat that SARS came from. And it killed only a few hundred people, and that was limited because of good hygiene in China. COVID-19 turned out to be much more transmissible, and we all know what happened next. So there are lots of scary things happening at this time. And then something truly terrified happened. Happened In 2011, Ron Fouchier, who was a virologist, went to a conference in Malta, and he said, this is literally what he said, he said, hey guys, get something like here in front of me, in front of the audience, he says, hey guys, I've done something really, really stupid. He had taken bird flu, H5N1. This is a really nasty disease that will kills birds, there's currently a pandemic of it, killing birds at the moment all around the world, in particular seabirds. Health warning, if you come across a dead bird, leave it, or a dying bird, just leave it. Do not touch it. Contact the authorities, because it may have bird flu. And the only way we can get bird flu, which is much more dangerous than COVID-19, is by touching uh, an infected individual. And it, it's not very good at transmitting between humans. So although it has infected and killed people, it's always been limited. Ron Fouchier was interested, how bad could it be? How can we prepare for the future? Because can, is it possible that H5N1 could become transmissible through the air, like COVID-19? Well, he didn't know about COVID, but you know, can it be transmissible through the air? And he discovered, yes, it could, because he changed it such that his experimental animals, ferrets, which are used a lot in biomedical research, if they simply breathe the same air, they transmitted the disease and they died. So, Fouchier not only said he'd done something stupid, he was terrified. So, in 2012, there is another pause. This is a letter that appeared in Nature, and for nine months or so, there was no research on this material, although, same, we're back to the same thing. They discussed how can we do it, not should we be doing it. I mean, my view is this stuff, this what's called gain of function uh, Sorry, I'm going to go back. Gain of function research, making things more dangerous. Whilst it's well-meaning, trying to work out how we can predict the course of future pandemics is too dangerous. It should be stopped. So, you worried about that? Now get worried about the next thing. <laughs> Heritable uh, genome editing. So, in 2019, this is the fourth example. There was a call for a moratorium on editing embryos. So, this would be changes that would go down the generations. It's not like with Victoria Gray, where it's only in her red blood cells. This is a change that will be in every cell, including in the eggs or the sperm. So it would go down the generations. But not everybody signed. If you look carefully on here, you'll see that, uh, well, Paul Berg signed it. He was still <laughs> involved in this in 2019. Uh, but Emmanuelle Charpentier, the co-inventor of CRISPR, she signed it. Jennifer Doudna refused. So there is not agreement. Not everybody thinks this is the right approach. Jennifer Dowder's argument is we can't stop it. It's a bit like the AI argument. We can't stop it. We're going to have to live with it. So there is no moratorium on this. Why did they have this discussion? Because in 2018, this man, He Jong Kui, he announced that he had edited, or he had in fact mutated, let's use the right terms. He had taken two perfectly healthy normal embryos in China, and he had changed their DNA in a way that was not medically necessary. He was not curing anything. Furthermore, it all went rather wrong. Because we now know that when you change an embryo in a human, or even in another primate, it isn't a pair of scissors. It's more like 
a chainsaw gone amok. You can lose whole chromosomes. Thousands, tens of thousands of bases get chopped out of your DNA. So these two uh, girls, in fact, we now know there's a third one who's been born. We don't know their condition quite rightly. Uh, that is not being revealed by the Chinese government. They shouldn't become a circus. All we can hope is they're still alive. When this was revealed and it caused a huge scandal, uh, the parents were terribly worried that the Chinese government might kill their babies. It'd be a good way of getting rid of the problem. Don't know what's going to happen to them. We have no idea. So, this is very alarming. Now, He Jong-kui was very vain and ambitious. He wanted to win a Nobel Prize. In fact, he got sent to jail for three years. So, it doesn't always work out the way you think it's going to. Um, but there are other people who think that maybe we should be doing this. So, in particular, they would say we could cure genetic diseases. But the reality is we already have a way of stopping genetic diseases from being transmitted. If you have a genetic disease in your family, you have uh, gene consultation with people about what the risks are, and if it is a serious risk, then you do IVF. And any of you who have been through IVF or have a, a female friend who's had IVF know that that is not a joke, that is not easy. It is a very tough procedure. But you go through IVF, and then, after the embryo has grown to a few cells, like in this picture, this, isn't a, this, is, a, 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 this is a drawing, it's not a real picture, yeah? uh, you can take one of those cells out. It won't do the embryo any harm. Human embryos are amazing. They're very plastic, very flexible. You take out one cell, and then you see, has it got the character that we're worried about? Has this been transmitted to the, the, the embryo? And if it has, you don't use that one. You implant the ones that aren't affected. So this is what we do at the moment. This is quite legal, certainly in the UK and in the rest of the EU. The only people, the only parents or potential parents who could not be helped by this would belong to a handful of, literally a handful of cases of very particular genetic combinations. And in fact, it's were probably the case that maybe 150 couples around the world, they're the only people who would benefit from this. Because remember, we're not curing a disease because there is no disease. You're allowing a particular kind of human being to come into existence. In fact, you're not... The thing you're curing, you're treating, is the desire of parents to have a healthy biological child. Now, there's no right to have a biological child, or far less a healthy one. It's a bit of a luck of the draw. And so we'd be making a huge step, opening the doors to potential claims of enhancement, of creating superior humans, simply to satisfy the desire of a few hundred people. And you know already who are those few hundred people, where they will live, right? <laughs> They're not going to live in a village in Africa. They're going to live in the USA, almost certainly. They're going to be extremely wealthy. These are the only people who could actually do this. This doing, uh, carrying out genetic editing is illegal in Europe, now in China, in Australia, in lots of parts of the world. Fascinatingly, in the USA, if you have money, you can do what you want. There are no federal laws against it. So it may be coming. But just remember, when anybody talks about enhancement or going and living on Mars or all the kind of nonsense people talk about in engineering humans, who asks the baby? Does a baby get asked, do you want to go and live on, in Mars and on one of Elon Musk's slave farms? Is that your, do you want to do that? No. You simply find you have been manipulated. You have been changed to meet somebody else's desires. Okay, the final thing, and I said, I said it was all going to be worrying. This is the really dangerous one. Oh, here we are. This is Fyodor Onofs, very clever. So he's the guy who came up with the editing phrase. He says, human heritable genome editing is a solution in search of a problem. There's no need to do this. We should not do it. It is very, very dangerous. Okay, the final thing, the thing really to be scared about, is environmental manipulation. And again, this is very well-meaning. 
So, starting point, malaria kills 600,000 people a year. Most of those are children under five. You live in a village in Africa where there is high infant mortality because of malaria transmitted by mosquitoes. What would you not do to save the life of your baby? Okay, because at the moment, everything that we're doing is not succeeding. Now, what we can do is produce something that is called a gene drive, that if you release it into a population, will change that population. So we are now not talking about manipulating things in the laboratory, microbes. We're not talking even about manipulating humans. We're talking about manipulating ecosystems. I'm just going to have to quickly explain how this works. If you make a normal mutant mosquito, let's say it resists malaria or something, or it, it can't, it, whatever, right? You can see it's the little blue one. And in the first generation, you, you release lots and lots of these mosquitoes, but there's even more ordinary mosquitoes out there. So very, very quickly, you can see that your mutant mosquito, which can't transmit malaria, just kind of disappears. Yeah? It just gets diluted in the population. This is what happens to most mutations, unless there's a huge advantage. But a gene drive using CRISPR does something quite amazing. Okay? It copies itself over. It cuts the other chromosome, the chromosome that's come from the other parent, chops it, and then copies the DNA over. There you go. So where we had one copy in the next generation, we now have two. Every individual now carries that gene. So what happens in the next generation? Well, they mate with those wild-type mosquitoes. The same thing. So basically, it grows exponentially. This was first theorized at the beginning of the 20th, 21st century, and there are, there are bits of DNA naturally occurring that do this, but they haven't been engineered by humans. They just copy themselves. It's just junk DNA. The first guy to really think about how can I make one of these things using CRISPR, Kevin Esfeldt, he said, uh, so he's just thinking about it. He hasn't done it. He says, I was pretty elated on the first day, thinking this is the answer to malaria. And then the next day, I woke up, and I was absolutely terrified. So I actually didn't tell anyone, not even my supervisor, for over a month, okay? So he was so terrified that if one of these things got out, you made it in a lab and it got out, how could you stop it? Now, the first people to actually make one didn't know anything about this. I mean, this was being written about. There are lots of articles. First people to actually make a gene drive were simply trying to get more of their weird flies. They were interested in, I don't know, the wing growth or something. And they couldn't get enough of their flies. And so they just thinking about it, thought, well, maybe if we could engineer something that copied itself over onto the other chromosome, we'd end up with lots and lots of the flies we're really interested in. And that's what they did. And to their amazement, it worked. And this is the paper. And then when it had worked, they suddenly realized quite how potentially dangerous it is. We were thinking, should we even publish this? And you can see the term they used, a chain reaction. This is literally like a genetic bomb that we could make. Now, at the moment, none of these things have been released in the wild. They work in big cages that people have made. Uh, but a big report in 2016 said there wasn't sufficient evidence at the, time, at the moment to support the release of such organisms. In particular, we need to find ways of stopping them doing, you know, knowing what they're going to do to the ecosystem, and if possible, if it goes wrong, calling them back. But that's a lot easier than it, uh, it sounds. And you've got a problem. You say, OK, let's go back to our village. The villagers are going to want to do anything to save their children, yeah? But they've got to understand what's possible. They've got to understand what the risks are. But how do you explain what I've just talked to you about to a population that is non-literate and which doesn't have a word for gene? So one of the clever things that the researchers are doing, and they're, again, extremely well-meaning. They're going into the, one of these villages where they're not releasing anything. They're just trying to work out what would be possible. And they're using theatre to explain what it would involve. So that's, I think that's very clever and intelligent, and that's the way we got to go. But whilst you might want that village to have a veto to be able to say, no, we don't want it, why should they decide not only for themselves, but for the whole region? Because remember, mosquitoes, they fly. 
for the whole region, for the whole country, for the continent, ultimately for the whole planet, because that's the danger. So we've got a real problem. We need to empower local populations, but we also need to think about very strong regulation. So here we are. We live in a genetic age. It's changed culture. Uh, we all talk about Jurassic Park. I mean, it is about dinosaurs. Dave's going to talk a bit about that. But really, it's about DNA. It's about genetic engineering. That's what certainly the first film's about. The rest of them are all a bit, a bit rubbish. And basically, you're just waiting for the dinosaurs to run amok. But the first film is all about the moral dilemma. You were too busy thinking about whether you could. You didn't think about whether you should. That's the heart of Jurassic Park. But now DNA is everywhere, yeah? It is in our DNA. We talk about it all the time. It has changed the world we lived in. live in. There are lots of fictional accounts and all sorts of things that have changed our world. But as Spider-Man learned, with great power comes great responsibility. And the key point, I think, is that this is much too important to be left to the scientists. At a Silomar, in 1975, they decided what was safe, but they decided. It wasn't us, right? It was 200 scientists decided how to do these things safely. Nobody said, should we be doing it? They only said, how can we do it? So we need to think very hard, and above all, that means it's all our responsibilities. Everybody needs to understand and have some view about whether any of these applications of genetic technology should be actually allowed. And if you want to know more, there's a book, and perhaps, certainly more cheaply, there is a three-part podcast, which I made during lockdown. Indeed, I wrote the book during lockdown. I could actually be productive. It was amazing. Uh, in which I interview all of the main people you've heard about. I talk to Paul Berg and Janet Mertz and, the, and uh, Bob Pollack and the rest of them, and the people who work for Monsanto. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's a brilliant uh, three-part series, and it will really take you to the heart of the matter. Thank you very much.